today's today's meeting uh, is being broadcast from Treaty One territories, and this is the uh, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples in the homeland of the Métis Nation. And I also want to acknowledge that the electricity powering today's event uh, is uh, is coming from mostly from Treaty Five and Treaty Three lands, and these are territories that continue to be impacted from ongoing hydro development on these lands. And we also recognize that the water that, uh, that most of us are drinking here and that supplies us with life comes from uh, Shoal Lake 40 in Treaty 3 territory. And uh, while I know many of you are coming from various parts of the world, various parts of Canada, uh, I hope that, uh, that you'll think about the, the deep web of interconnections of the people across Turtle Island uh, as we think as well about our historical responsibilities and our ongoing responsibilities that we all have to bear to overturn the wrongs inflicted on the original and, and continuing stewards of the land. Uh, today we're releasing a report uh, and learning about the need for better housing for uh, former refugees and thinking about this land acknowledgement as thinking about one of the things that we need to do to, uh, to make real that acknowledgement. So it's not just an acknowledgement that it's actually is real. Is we need to work towards better housing, not just for former refugees, but also reflect on, on the, deplor the deplorable underfunding of indigenous housing, both uh, on reserve as well as urban and uh, rural Indigenous housing. Uh, I know that uh, Immigration Partnership Winnipeg, one of the partners in this project, has worked tirelessly towards this for building bridges between all newcomer communities, including former refugees, and uh, Indigenous communities here in Winnipeg. And, and so this, this report, I hope, is part of that, that ongoing work that we're doing here. Uh, just one housekeeping note, uh, you may have heard just as we were starting that, uh, that today's event is being recorded and so that will allow us to share this report and share this, uh, uh, these findings and today's, uh, uh, today's communications uh, to a wider audience, but if you have any questions about that, uh, please contact me or contact Andre, our host, about that and we can, uh, we can address any questions or concerns you might have about that. Today's report, Putting Home at the Heart of Refugee Settlement by Ray Silvius, Emily Halderson, and Hani uh, Atat al-Ubedi is the culmination of a massive amount of research and effort over five years. Uh, it's based on interviews with former refugees, settlement workers, and experts in housing across Manitoba. And the authors in this report have really built a case that we need greater investment and support for housing for former refugees here in Manitoba. Um, housing for everyone is essential for quality of life and a key determinant of social health and inclusion. So it's not surprising that housing is also key to the successful settlement of refugees. I think this report really highlights the need for those investments and also highlights our ongoing obligation as a human right case uh, to provide that housing and provide those ongoing supports for refugees. Uh, this, this work uh, is part of a large body of research at the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Uh, this research uh, has gone on for, for decades now, uh, supporting a tremendous body of research demonstrating the need for both for greater investments in housing and also advocating for better social inclusion and more supports for in newcomers as well as former refugees. In fact, today's research report uh, is part of a major multi-year research project uh, called the Manitoba Research Alliance. This has been a series of research projects uh, over the past 17 years that's over that time has amassed a, a, 
a great body of research on these areas and other areas, uh, funding uh, research on poverty, funding research on the inner cities. And uh, this research has all been uh, part of the a project that's funded through the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And uh, I want to acknowledge that support and thank both the MRA and SHRC for their support of this research and without whose work uh, this project could have never come to completion. And while I'm thinking about the Manitoba Research Alliance, I, I do want to uh, thank Andre Forrest, who's working really hard behind the scenes for this event and, and uh, in front of the camera, as you see, uh, working to make sure that uh, this, this event happens. She's our MRA coordinator and has done so much work uh, working with the researchers and providing them the, the uh, support they need. And I also want to thank today uh, Kathleen uh, Groen, who's helping with the tech for today's event. Thanks so much, Kathleen. Um, I want to encourage everybody, if you do have any, any further thoughts or, or want to know more about the MRA and its research, uh, there is a website, mra-mb.ca, and you can view uh, all this research, including today's report there, which should be up soon if it's not up there already. Um, so the, uh, the, the research today, uh, we are lucky to have an incredible team of researchers who are behind this project. And uh, we'll be hearing as well today from some of the people who informed the research of this project. So uh, I'll just give a quick bio and introduction to the folks who you're gonna be hearing from today before I pass it on to the researchers to, uh, to carry forward uh, the, the rest of the event. So today we have Ray Silvius. Uh, he's one of the co-authors. Ray is an associate professor at the Department of Political Science at the University of Winnipeg. And his research interests include uh, refugee settlement and community engaged researcher. Uh, he's the lead community engaged researcher on the immigration network, that's the Siri network. We also have Emily Halderson. Uh, she's a community researcher and she's a community planner and researcher. Her diverse interests arise from her community development work include housing, education, criminal justice, immigration and settlement and the environment. Uh, the common thread is a commitment to research which supports the hard work of nonprofits and activists advocating for social change. And Hani Alubedi is also a co-author. He's the uh, project director for the Immigration Partnership Winnipeg, whose mandate and vision is to create a welcoming and inclusive community where Indigenous and newcomers can fully participate. And he's been a community activist for nearly 20 years. His goal is to remove barriers on the path of creating a welcoming community for all and deconstruct negative narratives around newcomers and indigenous communities. He is cross-cultural mental health specialist and uh, community-based research director. And uh, we're also gonna be hearing today from uh, Cody Gunther from New Jersey Housing. Uh, Cody is the New Jersey, uh, has been with New Jersey Housing since it began in 2009 and has been in the executive director role since 2013. Uh, Cody is on the Right to Housing Steering Committee and the co-chair for MANSO, the Manitoba Association of Newcomer Serving Organizations Housing Committee. And we'll finally, we'll be hearing from Azarius uh, Butario. He's a former government assisted refugee New Jersey, uh, with New Jersey Housing. Azarius started working at New Jersey Ho New Journey Housing as a housing advisor in 2010 and has excelled in this role, both as a workshop lead working with clients to find housing and deal with housing related situations uh, and with helping newcomers buy homes in Manitoba. Azarius came to Canada in 2007 as a government assisted refugee and lived in both ERCOM and Manitoba housing before purchasing his own home. Azarius is active within the Rwandan community 
as they work towards teaching their culture to young people in the community. So thank you so much. I'm going to pass it on after that, those, uh, those great bios uh, with, with tremendous expertise. And I'll pass it on to Ray to tell us more about the research. Thanks, Josh. I'm actually going to quickly bounce it over to Hanny to give a few words of introduction um, from, from his point of view. So Hanny, take it away. And then Emily and I will do um, our part. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Ray. And thank you, Josh, for the uh, great uh, introduction and uh, reminding us that we all uh, reside on uh, Terrace uh, number one and, and, uh, and the value that uh, that uh, brings to, to our thinking in terms of whether that is a research or any community-based uh, work. And also, I want to say good morning to everyone. I'm extremely happy to be uh, among you here and uh, to share the fruitful results of a long, long journey of um, making the connection between the academic research to the needs of the community. And I don't want to miss one essential part of this uh, connection building and the relationship and the history that exists between communities and the academic research. And so I want to take you back in a in, in little history type of uh, journey and uh, I want to say that this is didn't really this research started in 2015, but the roots of it really goes back to 2004, when I was in my previous work. Um, I have the I had the privilege to continue my connection relationship with my mentor and my former professor Jim Silver, who has greatly impacted my personal life and and. Uh, I don't know if he knows that or not, but it's a, he played a crucial role in terms of support. And he, and through this relationship, uh, Professor Jim Silver uh, used to send me students every, every year to do their practicum and to focus on housing. And they write a report at the end of the year. And that kept going for years. And I want to say, even today's fruitful result that I mentioned earlier, it's really uh, the seed of it planted by Jim Silver. So I want to recognize that and I want to thank him for this and, uh, and reflect on that as well. So, and then fast forward and uh, we, I met Ray in around maybe him and I were trying to figure out if it was 2013 or 2014, but regardless, we became friends and, and, and we moved from just a researcher that trying to find interviewees and conduct, conduct interviews and trying to explore a subject to a relationship that really evolved and became, um, developed the felt sense, the felt sense before the intellectual sense. And that is, we feel the needs of the people because we're in the midst of it. We're with the community. I was as a frontline worker. I knew what people were struggled with in terms of housing. I, I was there when, when things got really bad and when things got a little bit better when it comes to housing and providing places to people. And I also, that reminds me of, there's an Arabic adage or saying that says, a house is where one lives and a home is where one uh, takes refuge. Uh, and, and that adage or that saying is really kind of uh, sums it up for me. Uh, we, as a former refugee, we are on a journey of seeking for the sense of finding a home for us. We went through many housing situations. We change houses, places, but we seek home. And that's why the title has the word home. And home, I, my wish is through my current work and the work throughout the settlement sector and also beyond the settlement sector but through the larger society is to provide that sense of home to form refugees and the people who seek home after being uprooted and displaced and so on and so forth. So uh, with that, I wanna say that this research came as a result to hard work from both researchers like Professor Jim Silver, Ray, Sylvia, uh, Emily, and others who tried to get into the community and not to stay in the, I don't wanna use the, uh, of ivory tower of academia but 
to stay away from the community and just write reports or write papers that eventually sit on shelves and not to be translated into actionable uh, uh, research projects. And this one, we try to make it action-oriented type of work. Ray, Emily, it has been very, very uh, fruitful, great opportunity, uh, learning lesson type of thing that the work that I've done with you over the five years. And during those five years, we started in 2015, but then I accepted a contract to look after the permanent settlement for refugee, the Syrian refugees. And that took a different curve. And that took, a, took, me a, to a, took us to a different pathway. And we saw how, when political will is available, how resources can be also uh, available. Um, through the rent supplement program, for example, and you will find some reference in that report to this specific program, um, uh, where hundreds of Syrians access places that otherwise would not be accessible without that specific program. So it took a political will, but also good thinking on the part of the community to come up with ideas to make this as a reality for many who needed it. So they access housing and I'm hoping now, that they're, now they are on the path to access the sense of being at home and which is the highest level of integration, the sense of belonging. And so I don't wanna take longer, but it is basically there's history to community-based research. Community-based research, that's just, it doesn't happen just because someone made a, make a, makes a phone call to an organization and ask questions about research uh, interviews and so on and so forth. But it is actually you, in the embodiment, the, the, the being embedded in the community. And I think what I admired about Ray and Emily's work is the fact that they were able to um, uh, be in the community, live, at least be, closer to the experiences of those who struggle with housing from the former refugees. So in short, what I'm trying to achieve here and making uh, the point with respect to the connection between the academic research and the community needs and how you establish that connection. And I think that connection was made strongly uh, established connection throughout the, uh, this long journey and the results, you will see it in this report. Um, it, it highlights all the concerns that people have, but also it offers some solid recommendation that organizations in the settlement sectors would take and hopefully use as tools to, to advance their uh, organizational objectives, but also to address the needs of those that they serve. So that for that reason, I find it very practical, useful, and it, it, it just gave a different type of uh, uh, perspective on what research can do. And for that, I'm welcoming you again, and thank you very much for joining us. And I'll pass it this time to Ray, and thank you. Great, thank you so much, Henny and Josh. Emily's going to be showing our presentation here. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I really don't have the time to uh, thank everyone that needs to be thanked for being part of this undertaking over the past several years. Uh, not only that, but they, they tell us in the academy that when we're presenting this sort of work that we speak to our research and we don't summarize our research and we wouldn't be able to summarize this report adequately. It's uh, well over 100 pages. It represents a multi-year endeavor. So both uh, to understand the scope of the initiative and who's been involved in it and all of the people that warrant uh, thanks and appreciation. And to read the report itself, please do see the report. We very much encourage you to do so and, and hope that you do so. So what you're gonna see today, folks, is a very short and abridged version of what we did, but meant to give you a flavor and meant to hopefully elicit further interest in our work. And we're not gonna be able to do justice to every part, of this report, uh, but let's let's give you uh, our best here today. What did we what did we do for this project? As 
Hanny has mentioned, it started uh, early, uh, comparatively early, when uh, Hanny and I uh, were talking about doing some sort of research project involving uh, Welcome Place, which is where he was working at the time as a housing counselor, and trying to understand from this organizer, organizational perspective uh, what was happening to the housing situations of former refugees. And Hanny and others had this deep embedded knowledge. It was in their day-to-day -day life. How does one go about, uh, how does a team go about substantiating that in a way that's convincing to policymakers and decision makers and others? And that really was the, the impetus here. And so we received funding from the Manitoba Research Alliance to do this project. We wanted to do something over time because we knew that just taking a snapshot of a former refugee's life at a given moment doesn't tell that story. We wanted to be able to piece together the trajectory over some of the initial months and years having resettled in this case in Winnipeg. So we recruited through Hanny and others at Welcome Place at the time. We wanted 10 government assisted refugees and 10 privately sponsored refugees. And then one of the people that we recruited invited a cousin to join. So we had the oddball number of 21 uh, at the start of this project. And it gave us a really diverse set of people from different countries of origin, different resettlement trajectories, racial and ethnocultural backgrounds, uh, marital status, family size. And I say this because one of the things we try to do in this report is to demonstrate how categorically former refugees will follow a certain path oftentimes. Uh, it comes with the nature of displacement and resettlement in a new place. It comes when refugees are a particular object of social policy that gives them access to certain supports, denies them others. It comes in how former refugees are perceived in society. But ultimately, the real richness of this project is to be found in the um, aggregation of all of those individual stories and thinking about what those individual cases mean relative to what it means to be a refugee, a former refugee in a general sense. So that's how we started. We found participants that had been in Winnipeg between three and 24 uh, uh, months after arrival. And we followed them along for about three years for those that stuck with the project right till the end. And it's in this trajectory that we've tried to reconstruct partly in this report that um, we hope to get at the real um, nuanced and subtle relationships that housing has on resettlement journeys here in Winnipeg. And um, I think we can make the case for other communities in Canada as well. So what did we want to do then with all of this? The intention really was to document the reciprocal relationships between the housing situation of former refugees and other aspects of resettlement, employment, education, training, childcare, financial well-being. You can go on and on and on. And um, there's no way to capture this really elegantly in any sort of um, base scientific way. We wanted to do it through deep storytelling and then put all of those puzzle pieces together at the end and abstract away to, to action towards social policy. Just want to note in this study and uh, today, we say former and resettling refugees as a way to demonstrate that when refugees arrive in Canada and gain uh, the ability to permanently reside here, they are no longer refugees in a legal sense. And we say this to anticipate some of the negative politics that have been directed towards refugees as uh, racialized individuals and as unworthy recipients of public dollars in Canada. We've seen a spike in this uh, since we've been doing this work. But we also want to say resettling to show that this trajectory, uh, it, it doesn't really end in many respects. Uh, for those who came as refugees and are no longer legally refugees, that arc of resettlement takes some time. And we want to be attentive to housing for the duration of that time. Go to the next slide, please. Okay. 
so that brings us to our central argument here. It's really quite simple as um, you know, good arguments ought to be, but there's a lot of power to this argument, we think. And it is that a resettling refugees housing situation in the months and years following arrival directly impacts uh, resettlement, including short and medium term goals, needs and aspirations. And we might add that this is a reciprocal relationship between housing and then all aspects of resettlement. You might say, as we have in the title of our report, that uh, the pursuit and attainment of a home is really at the heart of resettlement and ought to be um, a primary focus for public policy when it comes to supporting former ref refugees. Now, we want to demonstrate uh, through the retelling of our participants' stories that attaining acceptable housing is really often difficult. Attaining housing of any type in overheated and expensive housing markets is itself a chore that necessitates the work of a considerable number of human beings. This was the central insight that I came to for my own purposes, seeing Hanny and others as housing counselors work so diligently just to find any home for their clients. And I think that effort is often lost uh, in the public discussions. So it requires support of those who are doing the work on that end and then attention to housing stock and housing markets themselves to improve the quality and affordability of housing on that side. But we also wanna stress that there is a real positive story that can be told here. And that is that public supports can make this situation better for former refugees. So better housing allowances, housing subsidies and social housing, this can assist former refugees find better homes and as Josh mentioned in his introduction, um, to think about uh, the housing of former refugees in their own unique sense, but also as a, a larger story of low income housing uh, in, in our case in Winnipeg and in Manitoba is something that we're trying to contribute to here today. So this brings us to some of the conceptual apparatus. There's a lot more in the report than we can talk about in this respect here, but just to, to orient um, the audience here to some of our thinking, we really tried to wrap our minds around this thing called acceptable housing. Acceptable, acceptable housing is the definition used by Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation and in much housing policy discussion. And it's used to try to get a baseline understanding of this thing called core housing need. So again, this is a, a baseline measure of what we might deem to be um, acceptable housing for, for anyone residing in a home anywhere in Canada. Acceptable housing is adequate in that it does not require major repairs. It is suitable in that it has a sufficient number of rooms for the inhabitants, and it is affordable in that it costs less than 30% of a household income. A home that is lacking one or more of these qualities is deemed to be in core housing need, and core housing need uh, has a number of individual and social level effects on those experiencing it that uh, other authors have done exceptionally well to document. We want to demonstrate that in the case of former refugees, having this core housing need has negative effects on other aspects of resettlement. But remember, this is a very basic baseline definition. When we spoke with our participants, what we wanted to understand is what sort of housing works for them and their needs. And particularly the needs that former refugees have in the initial months and years after resettlement. Is neighborhood important? Is proximity to services and family members and other important things like religious institutions or schools, does that matter? Um, do you actually have a say in where you live if you are a former refugee? And to what extent is your ability to have homes that suit your needs constrained by budgetary and other factors? So what did we find? We found amongst our participants, and we demonstrate this numerically in greater detail in our report, is that upon arrival in Winnipeg, former refugees are often relegated to poor neighborhoods with poor housing stock. And these neighborhoods have a disproportionately high number of households uh, that are deemed to be in core housing needs. So they settle in Winnipeg's poorest neighborhoods. 
largely because of budgetary reasons. And a large number will go on to uh, stay in those neighborhoods over time. While these may be the poorest neighborhoods in Winnipeg, this does not mean that they have housing that is affordable for the family or household or individual budgets of former refugees upon arrival. And this is something that we really want to focus on today. So in these homes, we see our participants experiencing recurring bed bug and cockroach infestations or mold or issues with heating and ventilation. We see them needing to file breach of contract claims against their landlords or property companies with the residential tenancies branch. We see overcrowded living situations. We see negative encounters with neighbors and neighborhood violence. We see uh, being disallowed to cohabitate with friends or relatives. We see living far away from school, childcare or workplace. And we wanna stress that while these are most certainly problems of poor housing in general and are experienced by all low income renters in some way, shape or form. The fact that it hap happens as part of this resettlement journey then gives a certain quality to this experience for former refugees. It's often against their expectations in coming to Canada and it's often against their needs as new inhabitants to this country after having been displaced um, from their home due to violence. So I'm going to turn it over to Emily now to um, advance our thinking a little bit more here. Yeah, thanks, Ray. Um, so obviously, the, the stories are really at the heart of this qualitative study. Um, but at the, the next couple of slides here, I just wanted to give you, um, sorry, an idea of the fact that the statistics also back this up. Um, our comparison of refugee assistance program rates and average rental costs yielded two key findings. We found that the RAP monthly shelter allowance is not enough to cover rental housing. And we found that rental housing is unaffordable for government assisted refugees during their first year in Winnipeg. And by unaffordable, we mean it exceeds 30% of their household income. So that, that definition of core housing need that Ray spoke about. I've abbreviated these tables quite a bit because it's a bit overwhelming for a presentation. So uh, just a few of the entries on the two tables are, are listed. Um, we know that resettling refugees in Winnipeg moved to inner city neighbor, neighborhoods for reasons of affordability. We also know that these neighborhoods have an high, high incidence of households who are living in core housing need. But what's really shocking is just how unaffordable the rental units in Winnipeg's poorest neighborhoods are. So if we look at GARS as an example, government assisted refugees, and we know that they're eligible for one year of support under the resettlement assistance program. Um, this table here compares uh, the average rent in a number of neighborhoods in Winnipeg with the shelter allowance that would be provided for either a single person or a couple um, with a couple of children, different, different categories. And uh, looks at you know, comparing that with uh, the number of bedrooms that might be appropriate for that family or person. And you can see that um, the green is uh, where the actual shelter allowance would actually cover the rent. And the red signifies the instances where there would be a shortfall, um, with the darker red actually signifying the most extreme shortfalls. Of 27 instances for which we could make a comparison, there was actually only one in which the RAP monthly shelter allowance did cover the average rental cost. In the other 26 cases, the shelter allowance is not enough to cover rent. And the shortfalls range from $17 to a staggering $879. Um, well, the RAP housing supplement, uh, which is a, a discretionary um, supplement that can be applied, uh, might be able to help. It is discretionary and isn't necessarily uh, provided and is a maximum of $200 per month as well. So look to the, to the full report for the full tables, of course, because these are, are not, uh, fully um, the, the entire table here. And uh, if we also assume that in at least some cases, the RAP income 
represents an individual GARS or GAR family's total income during the first year in Canada, then the unaffordability of the housing options in Winnipeg's poorest neighborhood, neighborhoods becomes even more apparent. In this chart, we compare the total wrap income, monthly income, sorry, which would include the shelter allowance, but it would also include the allowance for the other basic needs. And we compare that with the average monthly cost of rent in those same inner city neighborhoods. Again, the results are staggering. In all but two cases, the average cost of rent meets or exceeds 50% of the total wrap income, which of course is well beyond that 30% threshold that we talked about when we defined core housing need. There's a structural core housing need for RAP eligible former refugees, given these discrepancies that you're seeing here. GARs are compelled to settle in Winnipeg's poorest neighborhoods because they might be perceived as more affordable. And it might be true that they are priced uh, cheaper than other, other neighborhoods, but it's still a fact that the housing is not affordable here. We can't make the same comparisons for the privately sponsored refugees because they don't necessarily they don't receive the same resettlement assistance in their first year. Um, the PSR sponsors are, are to take care of their basic needs during the first year or until they're able to to help uh, take care of their own needs. However, we do know that a lot of PSRs actually do leave their sponsors home early before that year is up and they might not receive support from them. Many go on employment and income assistance, and we can uh, assume that probably many of them face the same affordability crisis that GARs do. Uh, I'm going to pass it back to Ray here for just one, one slide here. Great, thanks, Emily. So for those social researchers in the crowd, uh, you'll, you'll understand this uh, next move here. How do you take hundreds and hundreds of pages of interview data accumulated over the years and make sense of, um, in some cases, these highly personal and individual stories, right? And and build something common out of them. Well, you build themes and you build concepts, right? And these are three concepts that we deploy in this research to help us get at these more structural uh, phenomena that we're seeing. The first that you see here is the deluge of resettlement. And it refers to the large and often overwhelming number of fundamental needs that must be tended to immediately upon resettlement for former refugees. So for those of you that work with refugee serving organizations or maybe former refugees uh, yourselves, you will understand what it means to have to resettle in Canada and the unfathomable number of things that you have to do to sort out a life here, whether it be securing that home, attaining employment or income supports, undertaking language training or other forms of education or professional training, uh, finding places for your home, uh, for your children uh, to be tended to, tending to your family members' needs overseas, some of whom you may be awaiting reunification with. It's a tremendous amount of responsibilities to undertake in a short period of time while you're acculturating to a new city, society, and environment. And it is in this context that this home as a relative bastion of security or as something that further compounds your challenges needs to be understood. So that's the concept of the deluge of resettlement. We came up with this idea of the resettlement conundrum and it can be articulated as uh, when being amid a scarcity of resources, it's ha the conundrum is that the pursuit of one core need such as housing, employment, language training, childcare, even dietary needs as we'll show later on leads to compromises in other core needs. So this is particularly acute for um, low income former refugees when having to make uh, almost uh, impossible decisions as to what to pursue and what to go without. And this conundrum that they find themselves in has repercussions over time as we demonstrate more, more fully in the report. And this leads to uh, our last concept that we wanna articulate here today that being impossible trade-offs. So experiencing this conundrum of what to pursue and what to go without, these impossible trade-offs may be understood as the difficult decisions themselves that former refugees make when they're put in this position of having to decide what to do and what to go without. These decisions can affect 
life and health and mental health and familial well-being and economic well-being and short and medium and long-term employment prospects. Um, but they have to be made in the moment due to immediate necessity. And the horizon that we have with this research affords some insight into the repercussion of these trade-offs over time. We cannot give full um, demonstration to this in the research here today. Um, what we can do is sort of uh, through the words of our participants, as we'll do in a moment here, start to articulate the interrelationships of housing and some of these other needs in the course of resettlement uh, and allow the words of our participants to perhaps resonate more strongly than, than ours could. And so while we're highlighting these difficulties, again, we want to stress that good housing policy, good social policy and support from um, all levels of government and uh, society in Canada can ameliorate the situation. It's not a hopeless situation. It's one that can be bettered with more appropriate investment and infrastructure. So we will uh, turn it back to Emily here to uh, start articulating some of the words of our participants. Oops. Oh, there we go. There's a little delay with this, the change of the slide. Uh, thanks, Ray. So yeah, I'm just gonna talk about a few of, of the quotes. Uh, we, we had hoped to have one of our participants join us and uh, it unfortunately wasn't able to happen. Um, it would have been great to, to hear from one of them, um, but uh, we can share with you some of their words. And again, we can hope that uh, you, you're able to read more in the, in the final report. Um, this quote from Jigam, uh, who's from Bhutan and was a government assisted refugee, demonstrates how important housing subsidies like rent assist are as uh, resettling refugees are navigating the deluge of resettlement that Ray spoke about. Well, they're also living in, in rental housing that would be otherwise unaffordable. Jigam explains that when I used to get rent assist, I knew that I can do this much and that much with the amount that I have. But when the rent assist was stopped, I thought that I should cut out some of my stuff. It was challenging in that way. In terms of household goods, for example, grocery items, uh, when I was getting rent assist, we would buy whatever we want more than that at times, because we had enough money to buy that. When the rent assist was stopped, we cut that and we bought limited only. In Jigam's case, despite the fact that his income was slowly increasing over time due to his, his uh, advances in his, his employment, the loss of uh, rent assist was still representing a big drop in the overall income of his family, which led him to make impossible trade-offs, like reducing spending on groceries for his family in order to pay rent. Uh, many of the people we spoke to had a, a really different understanding of what their life in Winnipeg might be like. And this, this always seemed to, often seemed to extend to their housing situations. They had thoughts about what their house might look like and where they might live. Uh, Dennis's reflections are particularly impactful. He told us, we thought Canada was the best place. When we came, everything was fine. But since we came to this house, uh, that would have been moving from welcome place, transitional housing, into their first home. Uh, that is when we see the reality on the ground. In the house, we find some bed bugs. It's very hot. It's very small. Imagine mom and her children have to sleep in the same bedroom. I don't see any difference between here and back home. I said, it's better back home because back home, the wife doesn't have to sleep in the same room as the kids. That's the problem that I have regarding housing. It's not a good situation. If I get a job, I will move quickly. When he remembered this apartment later on at one of our uh, later interviews with him, and uh, he had already moved to a, a larger unit, although it had its own challenges related to the safety of the neighborhood, um, he, was, he was remembering his first home and he said, uh, my first home looked like a prison. I don't even like to remember about that house. Sadly, many of our participants lived in housing of poor quality, not unlike what Dennis describes. And as you can imagine, this is not what they had hoped life in Winnipeg would be like. Daniel from Sudan 
uh, came to Canada alone and he didn't have any immediate family here. His words here provide an example of the resettlement conundrum. In his case, TV and internet provided entertainment, but that it also provided the ability to stay connected with his family overseas and also the ability to further his education. But these bills, when combined with rent, left very little money for anything else. He told us, I'm trying to make it economic to cook by myself because the money government is giving is not enough. Once you pay for the rent and you pay for the TV and the internet, there isn't anything left only a hundred something. And with this, you need to buy food. It is too small. It is not easy. For Daniel specifically, um, he suffered from a, a number of chronic health conditions and he really needed to adhere to a healthy diet to, to see improvements in his health. And so this insufficient grocery budget, this was a really serious threat to his health. For Marguerite, um, a small rent increase of just $20 had a really big impact on her monthly budget. When we asked her how she might spend money, uh, the, the money if she was to receive an extra $300 each month, this is a common question we asked uh, most of our interview interviewees. She told us the problem I have for, for example, is that they add $20 on the rent and I use laundry machines outside. If you give me that $300, it would help me to do laundry. That would be a good thing because I need to do cleaning. For example, look at how many they are, her children. Laundry takes a bunch of money. So if I do laundry for everyone, it might not be enough. I take it to the laundromat, but because I had financial issues, I used to wash it with my hands. The clothes that will be worn tomorrow and then wash them another day, just using my hands. For Marguerite, the impossible trade-off that she was confronted with was the need to sacrifice doing laundry in order to pay the rent. Um, well, government-assisted refugees experience many instances of the resettlement uh, conundrum and impossible trade-offs while they were receiving uh, RAP. Many government-assisted refugees and the privately sponsored refugees felt that their financial challenges actually increased when they transitioned to EIA. Samira articulated this when she told us, the moment I started taking EIA, that is when it changed. And I realized that this is not the way of life that I can support my daughter. I have to work. That is when I started thinking of working. And the main reason is the first two months after I started taking the EIA, my whole life fell apart. I became so stressed out because of the amount of money I am getting and how I cannot support my daughter. My daughter is with my mom who can't work. She has physical disabilities and cannot work. That is when I started thinking about finishing school just this one year and then after that I can work. For Samira who had a young daughter overseas with whom she uh, actually was later able to reunite with here in Winnipeg, that transition over to EIA had a really profound effect on her ability to support her daughter who was still overseas and also to continue her own education. Uh, with those limited language skills that she had and with no work experience in Canada, she tried desperately to find work and she gave up her dream of higher education. We have a few more um, reflections from our, our participants and I'll pass it over to Ray to share those with you. Thanks, Emily. In some of the cases that Emily listed there, uh, Daniels, for example, he had what would have been considered amongst the cheapest possible dwellings that you could have in Winnipeg. He paid about $300 a month for his single bedroom apartment and still couldn't afford uh, food for his acute dietary needs. And in the case of uh, Sumira, she had what was a really great stable um, relatively affording, affordable uh, home in a cooperative complex. Um, so even under better circumstances comparatively, some tough decisions to be made. I'm going to speed it up here because we're getting uh, a little bit tight on time for our part. Turn our attention to a couple more quotes though. This one's from Hyatt, uh, who comes uh, from Eritrea originally. And he came by himself as a privately sponsored refugee before eventually um, bringing his wife and children over. And initially he lived in supremely substandard housing in order to save money. And he did so consciously. 
And he did so in a way that was known to members of the Eritrean community because a lot of them would do it upon arrival in Winnipeg. And the reason they lived there is the following. That building, no one likes it. If someone wants to live cheap to support his family, he lives there and experiences the bed bugs and the chronic issues that they would experience at this particular apartment complex. When my family come, I don't know how to get the house for them. I don't know how I'm going to afford it, but I leave it to the divine providence. Hyatt was highly educated and a professional who could not find work in his field in Winnipeg, despite his um, bountiful accreditation and his supreme English skills and worked at several jobs, um, barely above minimum wage in order to scrimp and save to bring his family over. Next slide, please, Emily. Next up, we will see Ibrahim, uh, who is originally from Sudan, who came as a privately sponsored refugee, who lived by himself, left his sponsor's uh, home quite early in order to be independent and entered into this endless cycle of bureaucratic in incompatibilities between programs, let's say, that had him bouncing from rent assist to employment and income assistance, doing without both and having remarkably precarious circumstances. So this quote's a little bit tough to follow, but it really gets at this phenomenon. When I start rent assist, I applied for EIA. EIA said, you have to stop rent assist because you're now going to receive from EIA. They know I have school at morning and they don't finish my application, they stop. When I go for it next month, they send me, sorry, we can't help you. I call and make an appointment. And he says, no, we can't help you because you have school in the morning at high school. Why did they stop rent assist? It was going okay for me. He said, if you want to apply again, you can apply. I never got EIA, just rent assist. They pay me a little bit. It is not a lot, but it was helpful. Now that stopped too. No rent assist and no EIA. So Ibrahim's case uh, is at greater length in our report and it demonstrates um, navigating this environment for recently arrived former refugees and the amount of complexity that's involved and what one has to go without in order to accept some core um, supports. Next slide, please, Emily. Probably our most positive case with respect to housing was Mustafa and his family who, in spite of being government assisted refugees, found themselves in a de facto sponsorship situation with a church who supported them at great length and um, had a house that was heavily subsidized with the rent supplement program. So uh, over $1,500 a month home in a quiet residential neighborhood, they paid about $500 a month for. And as a result, Mustafa didn't have to race out to a survival job. He took his time with English courses and he supported his family, including one of his children with a, a severe disability that required a ton of attention and resources. I am one of the lucky ones. I got this house and I do not have to pay more than my housing budget. The rest is covered by rent supplement. If I did not have this rent supplement, probably my situation would be the same as others and the money I am getting would not be enough. And one more quickly from Miriam, who is originally from Ethiopia, um, uh, identifies as, as Eritrean though. And while she would eventually get a public housing unit, the frustration over wait times and the uncertainty in the initial months and years of, of life in Winnipeg proved to be a big headache, echoing the sentiments of some of our other participants. For housing, the waiting lists are a problem. For newcomers, if you say to them, wait four years when you're coming to Canada, today he needs a house. But people respond to him, waiting lists. Where can he survive for four years or three years? We don't know. So folks, uh, we have some recommendations, but we are going to turn to those at a latter stage of this, uh, of this event. And I'm going to turn it over to Cody next to give us uh, some of the perspectives from New Journey Housing. Great, thanks Ray. Um, yeah, thanks everyone, thanks for having me. I just wanted to, uh, I'm Cody from New Journey Housing. And uh, a few things that stood out to me when Hani was speaking at the beginning about research and leading to community projects and community work, that's exactly how New Journey Housing started. Uh, there was research from Dr. Tom Carter, years ago about how newcomers needed help navigating the various housing systems and needed a one-stop shop where they could go. And that's how New Journey Housing formed. Uh, so our goal is to be that place where newcomers uh, can come and get some help. 
doing all those applications, trying to find housing. Um, yeah, so that just spoke uh, directly to what Hani was saying there. Um, not much surprised me uh, from this report. We see this stuff every day uh, at our at our office. Uh, we see um, a lot of the conversations that our team have to have are kind of bad news conversations because we're sharing with our clients, here's how much housing costs. It's probably not going to be where you want it, or there might be some problems, but our goal is to show them what the options are and then letting them make their own decision. And like this research says, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made at one time. Uh, so we need to give them the space to uh, make those calls. And sometimes it can take a year for them to decide uh, or shorter, um, but it's just letting them know that here's the reality of the situation and kind of walking with them through that. Um, one of the big things in Winnipeg right now uh, is the huge gap in this luxury rental market and low income rental market. The vacancy rate, if you have lots of money, it's great. It's almost 14%, which is so high. You see those luxury buildings, it's like one month free, right? Like it's just a total other world than folks that are low income. If you make less than 25,000 a year, the vacancy rate is under 3%. So from 3% to 14%, there's a huge gap uh, in Winnipeg right now. Uh, and as we've seen through those charts that Emily shared, the RAP rates and the EIA rental rates aren't keeping up, even when you add rent assist to that. So they're always kind of trying to scrape by with way too little. And that's where those decisions come in. Um, one thing, I'm gonna keep this short. The big thing that I took away from this as well is that we need public housing and we need public support whether it's rent supplement programs or rent assist, because a private developer cannot make money on their units charging EIA rates for rent. That's not going to happen, right? So we need more public housing, whether it's Manitoba housing or nonprofit. I know we might plug this later, but Manitoba housing is doing a survey right now on what they should be doing. So we hope that people can participate in that because the report shows that if people are living in actual affordable, adequate housing, that makes a huge difference in the trajectory of their settlement. And it's going to let them focus on education and their kids and family reunification, so many different things. So if we can at least start them off with some sort of good quality, affordable housing, that's going to be, to be huge. Um, and I do, I'm gonna keep it at that. I'm just, I had lots of notes, but I'm just gonna keep it short because I want Azarius to speak. Uh, Azarius is my wonderful colleague, uh, and he's gonna share a little bit about his own experience um, and also maybe some of the work at New Journey if we have time. So thank you all, happy to talk more as well later. But go ahead, Azarius. Thank you, Cody. Uh, my name is Azarius. I myself, I have been uh, uh, a refugee in Tanzania for two years. I had a house in the refugee camp. Then I went to Kenya in a refugee camp called Kakuma. I also had a house in Kakuma. But when I came to Canada, I was among the luckiest. I had two homes. The first one is the apartment I was living in. I'm calling it a home. And the second one is Canada as a country. So I have a home country. So I'm counting myself among the luckiest one. I have two homes. So when I was preparing to come to Canada, my dream was a better life and to contribute to the development of this country. So when I came to Canada, I was lucky once again, I found an apartment. I was first of all welcomed by welcome place. And then I got an apartment, three bedroom with income house, a subsidized one. And later on, I went to Manitoba housing. I got an apartment in Manitoba housing. And by getting a good home, I was relieved. I was able to go to the Red River College. 
and I have done community economic development. I have done two years. Then after this, I went to apply for a job and uh, I got a job in New Journey Housing. I really like to work at New Journey Housing because I'm giving back now to my community, to the community of uh, uh, not only Winnipeg, but Manitoba as a whole. So uh, what I do is uh, I help newcomers to Canada, newcomers to Canada, either uh, former refugees or PNP. I help them to find apartment or houses for rent. And uh, I teach three workshops, rental workshop. The first one, rental workshop. In a rental workshop, uh, I talk about rights and responsibilities of tenants and rights and responsibilities of landlords. So when newcomers are coming to Canada, uh, we have our own way of renting. But when we come to Canada, it's different. It's different. So newcomers to Canada need uh, somebody who can guide them, who can give them information about renting. This is the first workshop. And the second workshop is home purchasing workshop. We hope, we hope that those who are coming, either uh, former refugees or uh, uh, Manitoba PNP, we hope one day they are going to buy houses. That is why we, uh, we teach home purchasing workshop, whereby we talk about mortgages, uh, property tax, property insurance, and uh, uh, real estate agent, and uh, home inspection, and so on and so forth. And also, we have the third one, money management workshop, whereby we talk about uh, budget, we talk about credit, and we talk about investment and taxes. So the time is not on my side. You have heard the challenges we former refugees, when they come here, they uh, encounter. It's, it's really uh, not easy. And uh, uh, it's our joy to help the newcomers who are coming to Canada with housing issues. And I really like the, the theme of this project, putting home in the heart of refugee resettlement, putting a home. I really like this, the theme of this project. So because of time, uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, all of you. It's uh, uh, a really tremendous amount of work that you've done here and really exciting to hear about the, 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 quest, uh, the, the research that you've done and the results of that. Um, we're now going to have a few minutes, maybe about 10 minutes or so. I know people do want to get to their lunches uh, shortly, but uh, we will open it up for questions. If you have questions that you'd like to, to pose to the researchers, um, you can put them into the chat and, and we'll, I'll be collecting them um, and, uh, and posing them to the researchers. Just to get us started though, I just wanted to ask the researchers, you did all this research and you know, I think one of the things that we really heard clearly this morning was uh, how the lack of supports really puts the settlement of refugees behind. And I'm wondering if there are any stories of success or how did you were able to find where those supports are in place, what the positive impacts are for uh, the settlement of refugee, either in the research itself or, or in your experience. Oh, go ahead, Emily. I just wanted to tell one uh, story uh, 
we we changed all the the names of our folks uh, to pseudonyms. So I I sometimes have trouble remembering the correct name. So I won't I won't get us uh, give the name for the person. Um, but uh, this person lived at a um, a. a uh, social housing, not Manitoba housing, but another uh, private, uh, like a community organization run housing facility, which had a lot of um, additional supports built in, in terms of a person living there who was able to help them. It wasn't ERCOM, it was another place, but in some respects, similar to, to some of the stuff that ERCOM offers. And this person, I, I shared a quote from her, um, in, uh, in my uh, talk, and she had a child who was, who was away, uh, you know, overseas, and a little bit older child, and, and this is someone she hadn't seen for, I think, almost maybe 10 years or so, and uh, one thing that uh, was an impact from her living in this facility was that it was the staff in that facility who helped her navigate all of those processes that she needed to go through to reunify with her child. Um, I just wonder whether she may have been able to, if she hadn't have had, if she hadn't had those supports. We also had another person who participated in this study, who uh, did have a child, uh, you know, back home, and I am not sure if that child ever was able to reunify with his uh, parents, and um, he didn't have those additional supports that this this woman had in in that social housing kind of setting. So. I just wanted to bring that up as an example. I mean, family and being together and being able to live together, um, that's so important for, for home. You're not, you're not at home if your children are not with you. So uh, I'll turn it to Ray if he's got something else to, to say on that one. I'll actually um, bounce it over to, to Hanny quickly first and then I'll say something. Excellent, thanks, uh, Ray. So I'll give you a re like a, an example that I actually I lived that uh, situation um, prior to the arrival of the Syrian refugees, um, and probably this answer would cover another question that I just noticed in the chat um, that people, based on the information that you just received, um, they have very uh, specific tight budget allocated for for one year. Um, and, and for the housing specifically is very, very uh, much uh, uh, tight budget uh, based on EI and so on, uh, like social assistance uh, budget, um, the provincial one. Um, so we, people resort to child tax benefits to add it to whatever that they have of money so they can afford housing. So that's in short, like in terms of answering one of the questions in the chat. I wanna highlight the fact that there are some programs, once they got expanded, they actually provide that positive experience. And that's the rent supplement program, where at that time, and I can't remember specifically the year, but probably around 2014 and 15, we had probably 300 units that are throughout the province of Manitoba that are considered, they were considered rent supplemented uh, uh, units. Upon the arrival or during the arrival of the Syrians, I remember when I was uh, leaving that uh, work, um, I had nine staff members who, whose job there to connect with the, with the province and specifically with Manitoba housing and to make the rent supplemented units available because the program got expanded when the, when the Syrians arrived, uh, arrived, arrived and we had larger uh, inventory of places that became available under this under this uh, program, and many many of the Syrians, and I can't give you a specific percentage, but we had around 2,000 or so during the, my time, which I had a contract work to look after the manage the permanent settlement work for the Syrians. Um, within six months, we housed closer to 2,000 people, and most of them, most of them access rent supplement in places because it was a joint effort province us working as a front line came together expanded the rent supplement program uh, uh, reached out to private owners or landlords they made their uh, places available the places got accessed by syrian families who would never would had been never been able to 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 
to access or afford those places had it not been to the rent supplement program. Because it's a, some of them ended in Bridgewater, for example, and others, uh, uh, there's some other areas in the city where you cannot ever imagine any newly arrived refugee with access. These expensive rental units. Um, but anyway, so this is the example. This is positive, but it came with combination of two things. Expanding of a program that it can have some costs associated to it and a budget, in addition to political will and social mobilization. All came together. The whole country was mobilized. The end result was positive, obviously, to the, the, to the refugees who arrived during 2015 and 2016. So probably I'm hoping that that would cover the questions in this chat. Thank you. Thanks, Hani. I'll maybe jump in quickly. This is a very difficult thing to do from a um, methodological standpoint from researching. And uh, public policy often requires this quantification of impact, right? So for those of you in the field and those of you in newcomer or refugee serving organizations, you'll understand demands made of you to sort of demonstrate the impact of your service delivery, for example. It's a really tough thing to do. So, so how do we go about substantiating the impacts of social housing on people's lives? It's, a, it's, it's hard. Um, we have a couple of ways to do it in our study. And the first is, again, it's one of those um, deceptively simple things that's staring us right in the face, to listen to the accounts of people that have found themselves in better housing situations as a result of receiving social housing units. And we have a number of cases throughout our report where people will speak about the positives of their new unit, particularly compared to their previous unit in terms of um, adequacy, in terms of cost, in terms of all of these attributes, find themselves in a, in a better situation as described by the participant. From our outside observer standpoint, it's not hard to imagine what um, having a better home does for a, a human being. Um, we can point to cases like Mustafa's, whose family received a, a significant housing supplement. They were able to get, um, as I mentioned, a, a standalone single family dwelling home in a, in a good neighborhood. They made connections with their neighbors. They stayed there for a long time. They were able to retrofit the home for one of their children with disabilities. They wouldn't have afforded that home. Um, it's unlikely that they would have been able to afford a home of any type comparable to that in terms of rooms and amenities. So we can imagine what it's like for a large family with a child with a significant disability to be in overcrowded, inadequate housing. Um, in Mustafa's case, he didn't rush out to take a survival job because he was able to pay for his home with um, the income supports that he received. He stayed on uh, English language training for longer than some of our participants. His wife was able to take um, language training as well, which is sometimes unheard of in a family unit when one must work and one must tend to the kids upon uh, resettling, right? So there are these seemingly tiny little adjustments that families make in their lives, but when they can do so from a position of relative strength, because they have cheaper and better housing, everything else becomes better. We don't have the ability to see into the future, but we can assume that if a former refugee comes, can spend more time on language training, can spend more time on education, isn't in this endless cycle of survival job upon survival job upon poor housing unit upon poor housing unit, we have to assume that that has an appreciable benefit to their life. Thanks so much. Uh, those are those are excellent responses. Uh, we just have time for a couple more questions. Uh, I, I want to acknowledge uh, Damaris. Thanks so much for your question about the Canada Child Benefit and and the impact on poverty. And and Hanny at least partly addressed that question because we do know that the Canada Child Benefit does help uh, lift a, a number of families out of poverty. Uh, including uh, refugees, but it is it's critically difficult for uh, for single individuals who don't have access to that benefit because of our the way we 
categorize uh, families and divide families in terms of who gets benefits. But uh, the questions, the last couple of questions I wanted to, uh, to ask, one is about the sale of public housing here in Manitoba at the provincial level. Uh, in the report, you talk about the need for more affordable housing, more social housing, and yet the province is, is selling off some of that stock of housing. And, and uh, Said asks uh, you to uh, comment on that. And then the other question is uh, kind of the other side of government is that while housing is often a uh, political, uh, provincial matter, uh, Brian wants to know, is there also a federal role there? And uh, thinking about an election coming up, uh, potentially maybe on, on both levels of government, are there questions that we should be asking at, uh, at either the provincial level or at the federal level of candidates in upcoming elections? I'm happy to comment quickly. Um, thank you both Said and Brian for those great questions. Um, Jim Silver's uh, work um, and uh, certainly for Winnipeg and Manitoba and others across the country demonstrate this way better than we did in our report about the long-term um, denigration of social and public housing in this country. And so we have to take that as the context within which uh, refugee resettlement and low-income housing has taken place. It's, it's gone poorly over time, right at the same time when private housing is um, structurally unaffordable for low-income, middle-income uh, Canadians of all stripes, right? So it goes without saying for me that more investment into public housing is where you start with all of this. Um, in terms of making it an election issue, uh, this wretched pandemic has uh, done so much harm. I am hopeful that what it can do is demonstrate when the financial capabilities of the federal government are deployed and when Canadian society is in support of that, um, good things can actually happen at the level of social policy. We can collectively improve lives. And so I think having the federal government's fiscal capabilities in public housing would be fantastic. We'd have to talk to um, a constitutional expert as to what that might entail, but I'm 100% for it. And I would pressure our federal government to do more in that respect, for sure. I do want to uh, direct everyone, uh, Andre's been helpfully providing some important links in the chat box. If you, uh, if you want to look at those, uh, there's a right to housing campaign about keeping housing public uh, that you may want to support if, uh, if you'd like to. Uh, there's a federal vote housing.ca uh, has, is a great resource for the upcoming federal election. And of course, uh, there's a link to the report, uh, which uh, I encourage everybody to download and study uh, because it is, uh, there's some excellent information well beyond what we've had time here to present today. So thanks so much to everyone. I'm just gonna pass it off to Hanny to provide a few closing remarks. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Josh. And uh, I want to also repeat the, our gratitude and thanks to Andrea and Kathleen, uh, uh, our research and community development project manager at uh, IPW, Immigration Partnership Winnipeg. Um, I also want to thank um, uh, my colleagues and my friends, uh, Ray and Emily, and also to our guests, um, um, Azaria and Cody, for sharing their perspective from the heart to the reality, of course, uh, when it comes to housing. Um, I just want to end this by saying thank you to all of you, and I hope this is this is basically the end of uh, of um, five years or so of uh, a steady project. But that doesn't mean the end of the issue when it comes to housing. And I'm very sure we will you will hear more of uh, a new probably project related to this issue or this specific theme. Um, and I want to close by another adage. I started with a, a, an Arabic adage, but I want to close it with, um, with another adage and, or saying where, where sometimes 
housing is great. One of the steps that kind of moves us forward to that sense of being at home or at least closer to that. And so it can possibly uh, facilitate that process of integration, facilitate the process of being part of the society that you live in. And especially, this is especially important for people, as I mentioned earlier, in the beginning of this event, that being uprooted is not an easy thing that happened in people's life. This is people's lives. And when it gets disrupted, it's not easy to bring it back on the path of stability. And having a place to live, it's probably kind of a, a, a prerequisite type of step of that stability for people's lives. And so I started with an adage. I want to end it with another Arabic adage. And that says, Ra uh, rather a hut where my soul flitters than a castle where I am bound to walls. And that means, uh, obviously, we can aim for better housing, but also with that, we're hoping that people will move towards full integration, um, full participation, participation in our society and feel at home. And we want to thank you again for joining us today, um, hoping that we will build on this project and this work. And, and congratulations to my colleagues and the people who uh, uh, participated in this big project. And we want to thank the people who joined the interviews in this research project and share their life experiences and inform the larger society of the struggle that they face. Thank you all and have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks again.